very last session this is Pod X. What an incredible event it's been over the past few days. Um, I've heard there's been over 40,000 uh, attendees and registrants, so well done to the COGX team. And this session today, I think, is going to be really interesting. I'm, I'm looking forward to sitting back and listening and learning. And it's about music being made by machines. Will we love it? How will technology enhance the listening experience? So we're going to have some really cool leading musicians and academics as they go through the hows and the whys of music and tech. I think we, I'm really looking forward to this. So with that, I'm going to introduce the moderator of the session, John Robb, an award-winning journalist, editor of Louder Than War, and he's also frontman of the punk band The Membranes. So with that, I take it over to John. Hi, all right, thank you very much. So, um, yeah, this is quite a fascinating topic, and I think especially uh, accentuated by the past few weeks, where we spent all of our lives in, uh, like we are now in some weird kind of 2D zone. So uh, I've, well, I've been keeping this what five, ten years of the future is we've been the last five weeks and we've all learned what to become so many machines. The fact that machines make music rather than the world where we can play our games, that's not what it means. And we've not got to it yet, we've been given by technology and given by the future. So the first thing we're going to do is get each one of us to introduce themselves and then we'll come back and each one is prepared a seven minute talk about their take on the topic. So uh, just to introduce themselves and explain more questions. Hello. <laughs> so I'm not sure how the sound is because I was actually unable to hear. Um, it's fine. Hear yeah, it's cool. Ah, now, okay, great, yeah. wonderful. I'm Taryn Southern. Um, I'm an AI artist, musician, and former YouTuber. I spent uh, most of the past 10 years building a YouTube channel that was focused on comedy, technology, and innovation. And over the past few years, spent um, spent most of my time actually directing a documentary on the future of brain-computer interfaces. And that got me really interested in artificial intelligence, what was happening in the space, and in particular, um, artificial intelligence and music. So after doing some sort of hobbyist playing around with some of the early tools back in 2017, I decided to make an album exclusively with AI, which I released a year and a half ago, and uh, have had the good fortune of being able to, to perform and speak around the world about uh, that collaboration process, what it did for me as an artist, and how I think it could benefit other creatives as well. Fascinating. Well, I look forward to your talk in a minute, Taryn. Um, Marcus, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hello, uh, my name is Marcus de Sotoy. I'm a professor of mathematics at the University of Oxford. Um, I'm also a co-director of something called PRISM, which is about practice and research in science and music at the Royal Northern College of Music in Manchester. And um, I'm also author of a book called The Creativity Code. Uh, I've been looking last few years at the impact that um, artificial intelligence uh, and especially machine learning has had on creativity um, across all, all various different art forms, but uh, particularly music, one of my loves. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about that a little later. Thank you, Marcus. I'm, I'm 50 yards away from uh, the Royal Northern College of Music, so <laughs> I might bump into you from the other ends. Uh, BT, did you come back? You, you seem to disappear into some sort of cyberspace, but we'll hope you've returned. Are you there? No? Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll find out when you come back. So, Marcus, you prepared a seven-minute uh, talk uh, for us to start off with, so I'll return to you for your, uh, your seven-minute explanation. <laughs> Cool, great. Well, um, it's interesting because I think one of the first computer coders, um, Ada Lovelace, so we celebrate uh, Lovelace Day every year. Um, she was the first person really to start thinking about uh, machines doing more interesting things than just sort of uh, simple calculations. And she was kind of inspired after she went to see um, uh, Charles Babbage's uh, analytic engine um, which Babbage had created in order to just uh, do calculations, mathematical, you know, long division, things like that. Um, but when uh, the young Lovelace saw this machine, she uh, kind of speculated that it could do much more than just simple calculations. And she started writing 
uh, kind of instructions to make the machine do interesting things. And we really regard that as the kind of first example of computer code. Uh, and she wrote in the notes that she um, prepared um, for uh, these ideas of code, she wrote, uh, the engine might compose elaborate and scientific pieces of music of any degree of complexity or extent. So very interesting already in Victorian age, um, uh, here's somebody thinking about machines making music uh, via code. Um, and, and I think it's very interesting that music is perhaps, I think the most obvious place to start because music does have a lot of pattern and structure inside it, which perhaps uh, a machine can exploit using algorithms or perhaps pick up on and recognize those patterns. And I think uh, the fact that you, if you put on the radio, um, I listen to a lot of classical music, um, I can very quickly pick up uh, who the composer is that I'm listening to. And that's because there are particular patterns inside there, which are the kind of signature of those composers. So I think a machine learning uh, is, perfectly tuned to try and pick up patterns and maybe develop something similar or maybe to explore what else might be possible within this kind of sound world. Um, so last year I did an experiment actually at a concert in the Barbican. Um, uh, I, I would say that uh, Bach is the perfect place to start generally when people are looking at AI and music. They use Bach's music because um, it, it's got so much sort of pattern in it. In fact, I think it's quite algorithmic in nature. And in this concert at the Barbican, we were exploring um, mu the musical offering, uh, which actually Bach wrote some of the pieces in code, just little bits of instruction that the uh, performer had to elaborate and, uh, and kind of extend and, and create the music. Um, but uh, with a, a composer, uh, Rob Ledlow, we looked at um, Bach's keyboard works and we got machine learning to learn on these keyboard works um, and uh, understand the patterns behind them. And then uh, we gave the machine learning uh, code um, a, a piano piece it hadn't seen, one of the English suites, and we'd taken chunks out of this uh, piece of music. And we asked the AI from its learning process to see whether it could fill in the gaps. So we created this kind of AI bar hybrid piece, which we then played um, back to the audience. And we asked the audience to kind of vote with cards with red and blue, whether they thought it was AI or human. And what was very striking was that um, the, the audience found it very difficult to, to tell the difference. It was very good. Um, but there were quite a few things we learned from that. One is um, the reaction of the person who was playing the piece. It was Mahanis Fahani. He's an Iranian harpsichord player. Uh, and he said, look, I know this piece, but I know exactly um, when it goes into AI because um, it's impossible to play. Um, the, it hasn't got any fingering that's kind of natural. And of course, Bach wrote music that wasn't just nice to hear, but was also embodied. He wanted to play it nice and easily. So I think there's a really interesting issue of the challenge of embodiment. Um, music created by a machine often doesn't worry um, about embodiment. Um, there was also something interesting that uh, uh, Mahan said, these are called the English suites because Bach wasn't just interested in music, he was also interested in language. And what we'd failed to give the AI to learn on was uh, the fact that Bach loved the cadences of particular languages, which is why you have the English suites and the French suites and the Italian concerto, because they're kind of actually trying to capture the nature of language. So one of the things about AI is we often give it too limited a data set, and really we should have given it language as well as music to play on. Um, when we started to get this thing to try and do more than just fill in, another kind of aspect of AI mu generated music appeared, which is, although it's very good at locally creating something which makes a lot of sense, it kind of loses the plot. Um, so if it's trying to write a long piece, uh, it's, it just kind of starts to meander and it gets very boring. So I think this is one of the challenges of AI music, the element of time. Uh, inside there, that it, it finds it very difficult to see overarching structure in a piece of music. And the other curious thing was uh, the idea of complexity. What I've found in my book, The Creativity Code, is that the sort of art, both visual and musical and, and written word, actually, that it quite likes is it likes to crank up the complexity because it can kind of negotiate that. Whilst um, we start to find it very difficult to listen to the music that it's starting to create. Um, actually reminds me of one of my favorite AI movies, which is Her, all about uh, somebody who 
uh, splits up with his partner and gets an AI girlfriend. Eventually, the AI girlfriend leaves him because uh, the AI girlfriend just finds humans just far too slow in their interactions. Um, so it's, it, the the kind of music that's starting to be pushed, uh, uh, sort of pushing the limits. I see a kind of complexity that may be again a problem of embodiment for humans. Um, so although we created this machine which was able to kind of imitate bark, the most exciting thing for me was to push into the new. So um, we're now using this Rob Ledlow, he's at the Royal Northern College of Music. Uh, he's using it to kind of uh, give him suggestions of new directions to go in with his own music. So it can learn on his music and then give new offerings. And I think this is the most exciting thing, the kind of idea of collaboration uh, between an AI and a musician where together they will go much further than each one individually. So I'll stop there. A lot of fascinating stuff there, Marcus. I mean, I just want to ask you a few questions before we move on. Fire away. Um, yeah, the, the first thing I want to bring up is the thing you talk about at the end, you, you've, you've built something in all the other college of music. Is, 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 this, is this a prism centre? Where, where That's you, right, you, yes, yeah. Can you talk about that a little bit and what, what it is? Yes, I mean, we've... Uh, I think there's so much connection between particularly mathematics, my own subject and music. Um, and I've always been uh, interested to explore those connections. So um, I've been working with Emily Howard, who's uh, a professor and composer at the Royal Northern College of Music. And we've been using kind of mathematical ideas as framework for for new composition. But one of the things we've got a, an event next week actually called Future Music. Um, and we've releasing a, um, a kind of machine learning uh, tool for people where the, the machines learned on a lot of the performances that have taken place at the RNCM. And, and then they've almost created its own new instrument from that learning process by sort of uh, bringing together that sound world and creating something new. So uh, I think that idea of using uh, machine learning to, to create new sounds, which then humans can take and explore and compose with, um, is one of the things we've been interested in, in doing at PRISM. So it's, this is, it's quite ironic, really, because when, when you think about machines and technology, it's futuristic. But in a sense, where we are at the moment, the machine is a primitive and it's learning from us. But we, we, one, is that true? And two, is it going to be a tipping point where the machine starts to uh, take over, in a sense? Well, I, I think we must be very careful of this narrative of takeover because I think it's very unhelpful. It's about collaboration, not competition. Um, and, but I think the really exciting thing is, you know, are these things just doing pastiche or are they actually producing new things? And for me, that's what's been very exciting when I wrote the book is finding a lot of fascinating stories. For example, there's something called the Jazz Continuator, um, which is uh, Pache, uh, Francois Pache at uh, Sony in Paris. Um, help to develop. Uh, and this would learn from the jazz riffs of a pianist. But then when the pianist played uh, in a kind of call and response mode with the jazz music, uh, with the with the continuator, the AI, um, his response was really interesting because he said, look, I recognize that sound world. It's my sound world, but it's playing things back to me I, I've never thought of doing before. Uh, and that's a really exciting thing that if this technology can actually, you know what, stop us behaving like machines. I think as creatives, we get very stuck in particular ways of, of playing or performing and, and we behave more like machines. So my hope is that this will act as a kind of uh, jumpstart us out of our machine mode and, and make us more creative as humans again. I mean, this is probably a, a very cliche question when we talk about these topics, but will the machines be able to input any uh, emotions into the music? And do, do they already? Well, this is, you see, people get very worried if they listen to something and then they're told it's made by a machine, um, that they've somehow been cheated. But I think you have to remember that uh, the machine learning is learning on our music, our art, um, our novels, our poetry. And so it's learning about our emotional world. Um, and I think that's why when we then hear back something which is new, created by the machine, um, it, it it, it, it's a kind of new filter on our emotional world. So, you know, clearly there's no uh, internal emotional world inside uh, the machine yet. Um, uh, but I think that what it's doing is helping us to understand our own um, world, perhaps from, from a, a new perspective, which I think is quite exciting. It's interesting you said yet there. I was thinking <laughs> ah, <yeah. laughs> with, with, with music, and we're talking terms of music here, 
will the music make that jump? Will music be important to the machines? We're, we're talking 200 years in the future, I don't know, but will this be... Probably, very... yes. But you know what? I think what's fascinating to me is that, um, you know, the code that's being produced by this learning process, it's kind of changing, mutating, becoming something very different from the human who originally wrote the code, which has now changed and learned. We don't understand what this code is doing. There's a lot of complexity inside there. And I think our art, music, is a way of encoding our emotional world. Um, but I think it's also a way of exploring our internal world. And so, you know, I could see AI music being a tool to sort of try and examine um, the decision making process that's going on inside this code, which has become so complex, we can't understand it by looking at line by line of code, but maybe by it expressing itself, we can understand perhaps biases, for example. I mean, that's one of the major issues for code emerging. The, if it's learning on things, does it learn uh, biases which uh, could mean that it's making bad decisions. So I think uh, uh, the art that we produce is a way of understanding a human internal world and sharing it with others. But I think that's also the role that it could play for understanding the complexity that, of code as it appears. And before we, we come to Taryn, uh, I just want to ask one more thing. I mean, when you listen to a piece of music uh, composed like this, do, do, do you input your own emotions into it your own understanding of it like like any piece of music written by anybody people always misinterpret it is it possible to misinterpret a piece of music written by a machine as well yes well uh, it, it's so interesting because i think it was uh stravinsky who said um uh music doesn't mean anything um it's not and that's why I think music is very interesting in comparison, say, to the written word, which um, really is trying to communicate a message. But the, um, so, you know, what you read into a piece of music, um, you, you bring, of course, a, I think it's a, a collaboration between uh, composer and, and listener, or, 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 you know, in the, the human situation as well. Um, but what's very striking is that I think that there is a recognition that, um, that we that music does stir the emotions and therefore have composers tapped into an extraordinary code for the complex emotional world in our heads which is you know basically neurons synapses firing but it's kind of projected it down onto this kind of strange well i've got a bit of music here um on my shirt but you know is that have they discovered code for our emotional world and if that's true then is that something that one transfer to a machine it can certainly simulate or maybe even understand uh emotions through this kind of uh coding that we produce which we call music i mean that it's a fascinating philosophical question though isn't it because is a machine uh, replicating the code but also is the comp human composer also replicating the code like a machine so there's a weird there's a weird little gray area in the middle which is which is it's intriguing me. That's what it's all about. That's the joy of this thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, Taryn, you've actually uh, done this um, yourself, but you're going to talk about that in your seven minute section, but you're going to play like a, a video first. We can absolutely get started just by playing a clip from one of my latest tracks uh, from my album, I Am AI. This one is called New World. Good morning. Welcome to the revolution. Good ideas all gone wrong. In God we trust until he's gone. So chain us up and right our wrongs. So chain us up and right our wrongs. For every block we build, their stories tumble down. Can you hear the sound? Welcome to the new world. That's like the world was broken. The world was broken. Today I real Hi, yeah, back. So yeah. that's uh, a little clip about halfway through the chorus of New World, which was composed using a couple of different AI softwares, one called Amper, uh, another called Google Magenta and IBM Watson B as well. So it was a it was an interesting collaboration. But um, I think I'll spend my handful of minutes here just talking briefly about um, how I got involved with AI music, my process of working with some of these platforms in terms of the opportunities and the limitations of them, 
And we'll end on a little prediction on how I think artists and, and certainly certain platforms will also use AI in the coming years. So I already talked a little bit about how I stumbled upon using AI um, to compose music. I've always been a hobbyist musician, but would have never considered myself a professional mus a musician. I always made music for my YouTube channel. And so as a result, I was always trying to find the fastest process um, for creation, which is certainly not the metric that I think anyone and everyone or any creative should be using. It just happened to be the lens of which I was um, creating art at the time, um, very much a model of efficiency. And because I didn't have a traditional music background in the sense that I never learned proper music theory or how to play an instrument, I could barely plop out chords on the piano just from you know teaching myself um, and watching other YouTube videos. And so when I read about some of the capabilities of AI for musical composition, it was really interesting to me. I grew up with computers and coding, and that's a language that made sense to me. So I uh, immediately dove into trying to understand what these platforms offered and what kinds of um, opportunities and limitations were there in working with them. So I reached out to every AI platform that I could a few years ago, said, can I somehow test your software and um, and they all agreed. And that was the, really the beginning of this whole experimental album project. Um, so, you know, one thing that I think is really interesting about um, this AI software is it works really well for beginners in the field. Um, when you're at the start of a career or even a new hobby, oftentimes you lack in several key, key areas. One of those is resources, another might be expertise, and then a third one would be industry connections. And in the case of music creation, I think AI can actually solve frequently for all three. Um, and so for a lot of veterans who are in the music industry, they may not necessarily come in with the same lens as what, you know, what these tools could potentially solve. But I think for, uh, for newbies, it's very interesting in that way. Um, so in terms of the process of actually working with these platforms, it's pretty different depending on the platform that you're working with. They all, some have front-facing um, front software uh, capabilities, others you have to understand how to code and you've got to you know, go on GitHub and actually uh, interface with the code that way. Um, so I'll give a very oversimplistic view of what it's like to collaborate with the AI, knowing that they are all, all very different in how they function. But essentially you start by giving the software data to learn from, a set of instructions, or what you might call parameters. So the AI knows exactly uh, what you want. And so maybe you wanna take a thousand songs from the 1800s and infuse it with a pop calypso style or apply synth instruments into a jazz style or take a hip hop track and mesh it with Argentinian folk music. I mean, you can do, you can kind of do any or all of that. Um, and then in terms of process, you'll make a series of decisions about what beats per minute, rhythm, mood, key, instrumentation you want. And depending on how the AI software has been set up, you'll inject those parameters into the system. And then there's this process of back and forth with, um, with the software until you're happy with the results of the song. And in terms of my album, there was a lot of arrangement happening um, with the finished outputs of the music that I was receiving. So from a creative standpoint, I often likened the process of working with AI as similar to directing and editing a movie. The AI is giving you a tremendous amount of footage um, and it's your job as the director and editor to both guide the process and edit the finished um, work or the footage into something that actually has a story and an arc and sort of an emotional um, fabric and texture for the audience. So, um, so that's how I've always th thought about working with AI as a creative process. In terms of the benefits, I found that working with AI gave me a lot of control over the creative process that I wouldn't have had otherwise, given my lack of, uh, no, I guess, traditional music knowledge. I would have, uh, in previous uh, years of, of trying to make music, I definitely relied far more on my, my producing partners um, to make a lot of creative decisions. Whereas in this role, I had a lot more of a, of a hand in how things sounded and how things turned out. Um, it also gave me a, a new language for how to think about understanding my own musical influences and style preferences um, in very similar a way as what Marcus was discussing when he was talking about how oftentimes humans in our 
in our own creative process, we often behave like machines. We have a process and sometimes we get very stuck in a certain process and it takes something kind of pushing us out of that. I found that working with AI really highlighted um, highlighted my own biases and musical preferences and I became much more attuned to recognizing those things as it was recognized by the AI software itself um, and then forcing myself outside of those boxes by essentially integrating musical influences that I wouldn't have otherwise um, necessarily thought of uh, thought of doing. So that was a very interesting point as well for me. Um, and finally, I think, you know, I think that AI has a very interesting role in the future of the music industry. It's obviously very early days, so only time will tell. I'm, I've noticed just in the last couple of years a lot more interest from other musicians and music producers and understanding at the very least how AI works and how they might be able to integrate it into their process in some form, um, what kinds of limitations they might have that the AI can take over for them. And I also think in terms of um, in, in, in terms of the point that I just made about, about forcing artists outside the box and thinking, utilizing new ideas, integrating new ideas, I think AI has, a, I think there's a really strong case that AI will, will play a role in that in, in the years to come for musicians and for platforms in terms of getting new audience reach, suggesting new types of music, um, all of the above. So, so in a sense, uh, you're instead of playing a piano, you're playing the machine. Would, would, would that be fair to say? <laughs> I mean, yeah, that'd be just, I suppose that would be one way of putting it. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I guess I would probably consider it more of a, like I said, a directing or editing process. I'm directing the machine in a way. So, so, so with the track that we just that we just played before the talk here, that was done yeah. with this process. Correct. So, so what what would you input in there to get each specific sound? I mean, with the drums, would you input "I want a pattern that sounds a bit like da 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 da" and it came out like that? Yeah. Well, I know with that particular track, I actually did the the inspiration for the track really began from one stem of um, of a tribal drum, which was the beginning tribal drum that you hear in the intro of the track, and I really loved the beat and the sound, and so. I ended up building around that. And I wanted the track to have sort of a pop cinematic sound. So I chose a lot of instruments that you might hear in a big movie soundtrack um, rather than standard pop instruments, but also had this sort of African tribal influence and element. And then I also ended up using, um, I think it was Google Magenta's Insynth that I used for that track where in, infused a couple of different sounds to create a new instrument, which you can hear in the chorus. Um, so it wasn't necessarily the case that every AI software that I used was actually used to create a melody or an entire string of musical notes for the songs. Sometimes I just use them to create new sounds or textures for the music itself. So, so in what ways would it be different from using GarageBand or Logic? I mean, it's obviously it's far more complicated, but are there big differences, or is it just more? Is it just like Logic plus one or something? Logic plus what? Well, like plus one. Is it is it just like a, a slightly more futuristic version of a GarageBand or a Logic? You know, because they have. I mean, yeah. No, it's interesting. I mean, I because I I never. Work, I actually never worked in Logic until making this album. Um, Cause again, I always just relied on going to my music producer friend's houses and, and humming a tune and saying, okay, now make that into a song for me. Um, so this actually forced me to, um, to learn more about the musical process it, it, in a way that, you know, before doing this, the musical process always seemed overwhelming to me. Um, with some of these tools, you're, you're, you're creating the music within their interface. So, they are different. I mean, if you were to use Amper's AI platform, which is front facing, you would see it's pretty different than the functionality of a garage band or a logic. Um, but it, it's in, in some ways it's the easier, I, I would say it's like the much easier version. Um, but yeah, so you could liken any of these tools to, I guess, a version of a DAW. Um, and 
I guess it just depends on the the knowledge and skill of the person using it, you know, what they choose to invest their time in. And what about the vocal? Is that suggested by AI, the melody lines, or is that your melody line and your vocal? The vocals were my my melody lines and my vocals, correct, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, and Lance Phillips, he's asking, uh, did you also get the uh, AI to create the, the video as well? Oh, I wish it was that good. Um, <laughs> I uh, I did actually utilize some AI image generation for my first music video, Break Free. Um, that it, it was applied towards just regular HD video to create these really funky kind of um, dreamscape environments. I'm sure many of you have seen the Google Deep Dream um technology but we use that for my first music video this music video was created in vr using google tilt brush and google blocks which are really just consumer vr animation products and um you know we, we put a, a camera inside of the vr sort of environment to create this 2d uh video that you see here but there's also a 360 degree vr immersive version uh, on youtube as well so we're in the early days of this at the moment of of AI and music. I mean, from your position now, your vantage point, you're obviously seeing where it's going. Where, where is it going? Is this going to get more sophisticated, easier to use, more choices? Yeah. Well, and again, and this is why I always I caution when I start out with any sort of talk, I, I always want to warn people of the lens of which I'm looking at this through, which was a YouTuber lens, which was a, a lens around efficiency, and high content churn, you know, as as YouTubers, and again, I'm not in that world anymore. I'm now in long form filmmaking. But at the time, it was my prerogative to make a video every single week and as cheaply as I possibly could. If I couldn't do that, then I couldn't pay the bills. Um, mm -hmm. And so as a result, I was really looking all the time at what kinds of tools are out there that can help me be as creative as possible, as quickly as possible, and as cheaply as possible. For some creatives, that sounds like a nightmare. <laughs> For mm. me, it was it was this just constantly fun, creative challenge and constraint. And that's where AI, at least for music creation, was very, very interesting for me. Um, it, 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 in some ways, it is a little bit like the dummy's guide to making music with some of these platforms. Um, other traditional music, musicians might look at that and just, they, mm. they'd want to roll over in their grave. But um, at Bach the same- probably is. <laughs> 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 probably, probably. But you know, one of the things that I value so much is that um, in in being able to create some of these things that would have normally taken me much, much longer if I had tried to do them without the help of artificial intelligence, I was able to focus more time and energy on other areas of the creative process. For instance, making a video in full 360 degree virtual reality. I would not have had the time to do that, I think, um, had I not gone about creating music with this process. Um, so, you know, where where one door changes shape or closes, another one opens. Um, and I think that's what AI music really, really did for me, at least creatively, was, was for, forced me into, you know, thinking about other ways to market the album, to create video content around the album, um, and just looking at music differently altogether. Uh, just a super quick one before we bring BT in. Uh, Jasper Wolf wants to know how many times did the AI tool fail to generate an interesting piece of music? Many times, <laughs> many, <laughs> many times. I, I mean, that's the thing. It, it didn't necessarily. It probably took me more time to create a track using AI than a professional musician. It would take to for them to write a song and produce it. Um, but it was a process that I could pick up and learn immediately. Um, but it was a lot of give and take back and forth, a lot of throwing out tracks that were, I felt pretty, uh, pretty terrible. <laughs> okay, so now, uh, now we've found BT, uh, BT Wolf, uh, you're the out there, so uh, hiya, you're okay. <laughs> yeah. So, you're kind of approaching this from a different kind of direction, aren't you? You're um, a musician who's fascinated, would it be fair to say, fascinated by technology you've done? really interesting gigs, interesting collaborations, taking music to interesting spaces, uh, literally space as well. So um, so do you want to talk about that in your your little talk? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so hopefully now we're connected um, after a few false starts. 
but yeah so you know for me i i create i'm a musician singer songwriter um in a very traditional sense in many ways um and but i also create new tangible formats for albums in the digital age which range from a theater for the palm of your hand to an album jacket woven with my music cut by the tailor who dressed Bowie Hendrix Jagger, um, recorded in the space where Eleanor Rigby, uh, Wind Cries Mary, all these amazing songs were written. Um, an anti-stream, the world's first live 360 stream, which was sort of like an anti-stream in my opinion, uh, the antithesis of our streaming culture from the quietest room on earth, uh, a space broadcast using the horn that proved the Big Bang, with the uh, Nobel laureate who won the, the prize for discovering cosmic uh, microwave radiation. So, um, and then, you know, I recently did an exhibition of these album designs in the Victorian Albert Museum with the Bowie Is curatorial team. Um, the Barbican uh, made a documentary about my work. So for me, it's really like, you know, I grew up writing songs from a young age, you know, loving storytelling loving art in the widest sense and seeing music as just a vehicle for more stories. You know, it was the combination of um, stories and music that just seemed to make sense to me. Um, but, and then, you know, discovering my parents' record collection at that same sort of time and seeing albums as musical books you could open up, read. There was a story, there was a tangible art form, there was a ceremony. And I just spent all of my time entering into the world of these records and, you know, imagining what my album would look like, what it would feel like as much as what it would sound like. And by the time I grew up, obviously, the physical had been replaced with the digital and we'd gone from one to the other sort of so quickly um, that I felt we'd missed a trick and I felt that we'd lost a lot along the way. So as much as technology and innovation is fantastic, it's like what actually keeps us human what keeps us alive inside you know what allows us to connect with one another on a human level so i i realized that you know my first album couldn't exist as just a digital download that for me was so boring um and lacked you know the tangible the, the story the ceremony all those things that i loved about the physical listening experience so I felt like, well, what if you combine the best of both worlds and you essentially use technology as a way of reintroducing a more traditional listening experience that still has a tangible component, a story, a ceremony, but is presented in a way people have never seen before. So essentially it triggers a different pathway and allows them to be fully immersed in this deep listening music experience, but today in the digital world. And it doesn't just mean that they have to go back to vinyl, but it's also not just, you know, entirely sort of, you know, intangible and, and virtual. So for the first record, the idea was, you know, because everyone had just moved onto their phone and I was like, well, how do you turn the phone into something that feels like a magic box, like the 80s viewfinder? So I came up with this way of essentially creating, it was a vinyl app, but then you had this little um, sort of, theater for the palm of your hand, you could slot your phone in and watch this record in this sort of new way that looked kind of like holograms, you know, were jumping out of the phone. Um, but it was, you know, very focused, very sort of captivating. Um, for the second record, you know, thinking about the album jacket and how much I loved album jackets and how much they, they told stories, I was like, well, what if you thought about an album jacket in a different way? And I just happened to be at the house at this incredible flat where all these songs have been written, Wind Cries Mary, Alan Rigby, all these guys from, you know, Lennon, Hendrix, um, uh, McCartney, like everyone had lived in this one flat. And I was there with the tailor who dressed Bowie and, and a lot of these musicians. And I was just completely sort of spellbound by being in this place and just had, you know, goosebumps. And, and you can feel the resonance. This is the thing about so much again about you know stuff we don't really understand like space holds resonance you know music holds so many aspects to it that we don't even know right now you know on a neurological level like music imprints on the brain deeper than any other neurological experience any other human experience so that whole mystery component that whole like you know magic serendipity like inspiration that's kind of where i 
lead from. So from being in this flat, I then had this idea to create essentially a jacket, which was, you know, a jacket cut out of fabric woven with my music that was made by this tailor who dressed all these musicians. Um, that was both something you could see sort of within the weaving, but then you could also tap your phone onto the fabric to hear the music that was woven into it. And that was essentially a reimagining of the album jacket. But then on the flip side, I wanted to create something for everyone. So um, realizing that the tape cassette was again, another lost sort of physical art form that I loved. I created a deck of cards that looks essentially like a tape cassette. You open it up, um, it comes in this little box. You have a, a card for each track of the album, lyrics, liner notes, artwork, tap that to your phone, instantly brings up all the content. Um, so again, it's this tangible you know, object that turns into this kind of dynamic experience. Um, so then by the time the third album was coming out, you know, we'd moved very much from, from digital downloads into streaming. And I just happened to be at Bell Labs uh, working on a, on a different project. You know, they invented transistor and the telephone and all these inventions, as I'm sure a lot of people are aware. Um, and, you know, one of the engineers said, you want to go into the, the world's quietest chamber in the space where Helen Keller experienced silence for the first time and we discovered rope frequencies and, you know, psych um, psychoacoustics and all these things, built the foil microphone. And me being kind of a super geek and loving, and loving sound and loving silence, I was like, yeah, absolutely. But, you know, I was warned that going in there, a lot of people freak out. They can spend 10, 15 minutes in there and then they have to leave. And I ended up spending several hours in there and just falling in love with this space and how music sounded in this space and sort of realizing that we have so much noise around us all the time, you know, notifications, social media, you know, this 24 hour shuffle in the background on one of the streaming sites, but actually music and art have become part of this background noise. And we're so bombarded, you know, our sensory systems are so bombarded that it's almost like, you know, we can't take in anything. So being in this chamber and realizing the value of silence, but also the value of music in its pure, raw sense, without all this technology, without audio enhancements or AI or any of that, music in the rawest sense that music could be. I felt like that chamber was the perfect place to stage this anti-stream uh, from. So, so we set up a you know record player for a week, it ran 24 hours um, for that week, playing the record physically, 360 cameras, live streaming. It was the first live 360 video. But then on top of that, people, as they were watching the record play and hear it in that you know, pure focused space using live animations, the animations would be streaming out of the, the vinyl in real time and transforming the chamber into the visual landscape of each track. Um, so- oh, I think we're running out of time here, BJ. Yeah. Yeah, but we could. This is stuff I want to ask you. But we could pick up on that um, at six o'clock because we're going to have a before this. Um, Benny's going to have a little talk now, but we're going to come back at six with questions from the public, maybe, maybe from uh, from AI or somewhere. So some stuff I want to ask about that. So we'll go there so over to Bindi. Hi everyone! Um, what a fascinating session, and. Uh, you know, what a great way to almost end uh, a three great days of COGX. So uh, you've got 15 minutes to take a quick break and then please come back at six o'clock in this same panel to hear some uh, live Q&A from uh, hopefully all of you out there uh, to John and the rest of the panel. I'm sure they would love to talk more deeply about uh, some of the amazing music and tech that they've been working on. So with that, take a quick break and we will see you at six o'clock. Want access to more COGX videos? Subscribe now for free at cogx.co.